Chapter Twenty of Captain William Kidd and Others of the Buccaneers by John S. C. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: The March from Chagres to Panama. Preparations to ascend the river. Crowding of the boats. The bivouac at Bracos. Sufferings from hunger. The pathless route. The boats abandoned. Light canoes employed. Abandoned ambuscades. Painful marches day by day the feast on leathern bags murmurs and contentions the indians encountered struggling through the forest the conflagration at santa cruz battle and skirmishes first sight of panama descent into the plain feasting from the prisoners morgan learned that three weeks before their arrival the garrison of chagres was informed by a message from cartagena that the english were equipping a fleet at hispaniola for the capture of panama the governor immediately sent one hundred and sixty-four soldiers to strengthen the garrison at chagres which had previously numbered but one hundred and fifty morgan was also informed that the governor of panama had placed several ambuscades along the chagres river and that a force of three thousand six hundred men was awaiting his arrival at chagres these were tidings sufficient to appall any ordinary mind but the pirates were accustomed to triumph over vastly superior numbers there were several large spanish boats at chagres adapted to river navigation all these morgan seized they generally mounted two great iron guns and four smaller ones of brass these vessels with those he took from his ships made a flotilla of thirty-two gunboats they were manned by twelve hundred sailors five hundred were left behind to garrison the castle one hundred and fifty had charge of the ships on the eighteenth of august sixteen seventy morgan put his fleet in motion to ascend the chagres river on his advance to panama his boats were greatly crowded and so heavily laden with men ammunition and arms that he could take but a small supply of provisions he expected to provide himself abundantly from the supplies he should find in the spanish ambuscades the first day the little fleet ascended the river but eighteen miles to a place called bracos the men on board his boats were greatly cramped in their limbs having but little room to move and none in which to lie down they therefore found it necessary to land for the night that they might enjoy a few hours of sleep they also hoped to rob some of the neighboring plantations nearly all their food had disappeared in this one day's sail the cheer of campfires seems to be essential to all bivouacs the gloom of the dense tropical forest was soon illumined by the flames around which twelve hundred men were congregated most of them went supperless to their mossy beds consoled only by their pipes of tobacco in the morning they ranged the country in vain for food the planters had fled taking with them or destroying everything that could be eaten again they repaired to their boats hungry disappointed and murmuring they ascended the river about twenty miles further until they reached a place called juan galejo here they were compelled to leave their boats as the river was so shallow from want of rain it was also much impeded by decayed and fallen trees thus ended the second day there was no road for an army through the rough miry tangled maze they were told by the guides that at the distance of two leagues they would find the country more favorable with sabre and hatchet these half-famished men hewed a narrow path for themselves they fed upon berries roots and leaves one hundred and sixty men were left to guard the boats and to feed themselves as best they could by hunting or plundering or obtaining supplies from the fleet morgan had advanced but a mile or two when the gigantic growth and interlacing vines seemed to render the forest impenetrable the river also deepened a little so that some of his boats would float there was imminent danger every moment that he would fall into some ambuscade he sent back for some light canoes to be brought up this was accomplished with great labor he then embarked his men taking a part at a time and thus ascending the river a few miles farther reached a place called cedro bueno to accomplish this the canoes made several passages the pirates were very eager to encounter the spaniards as their only means of obtaining any food but the spaniards wisely left them to the hardships of their march and to the pangs of starvation 
the morning of the fourth day dawned upon these wretched marauders most of them struggled along the banks of the river led by one of their guides others toiled against the stream in the canoes being often compelled to alight in the water to cross sandbars or surmount rapids to guard against ambuscades the guides were kept a quarter of a mile in advance the spaniards had sent forward their indian scouts and kept themselves informed of every movement of the foe about noon of this day they reached a place which from its extreme ruggedness was called torna caballos here the guides came rushing back to the main body with the announcement that they had discovered an ambuscade the half-starved men were delighted they knew that the spaniards on all their expeditions provided themselves luxuriously with food examining their muskets their priming and their sabres that they might be prepared for a resistless charge they pressed eagerly yet cautiously forward they soon came in sight of an entrenchment which was shaped like a half-moon their practised eyes told them that it would protect a garrison of about four hundred men twelve hundred men impelled by rage and hunger with hideous yells rushed upon it bitter was their disappointment when they found no foe there they had captured but an abandoned and crumbling rampart there were some coarsely tanned hairy leather bags scattered around their hunger was so great that these were cut up cooked and eaten we have a minute account of the cookery of these unsavory morsels first they took the leather and sliced it in pieces then they beat the pieces between two stones rubbing them and dipping them in the water to render them supple and tender lastly they scraped off the hair and roasted or broiled the pieces upon the fire being thus cooked they cut it into very fine pieces which they helped down with frequent gulps of water which by good fortune they had nigh at hand i can assure the reader writes oxmelin that a man can live on such food though he can hardly get very fat esquemeling adds some who were never out of their mother's kitchens may ask how these pirates could eat swallow and digest these pieces of leather so hard and dry unto whom i would answer that could they once experience what hunger or rather famine is they would certainly find the manner as the pirates did by their own experience on the morning of the fifth day the weary march was resumed having had but little food save the leather bags they were in a deplorable condition the pirates were not amiable men they staggered along in their weakness over the rough ways murmuring quarrelling and cursing each other as night approached they came to a place called barbacoa here they found another abandoned ambuscade not a particle of food was to be obtained loud and bitter were their oaths against the spaniards dreadful would have been the fate of any of them who might have fallen into their hands esquemeling says that they were so consumed by hunger that if they had caught any of the spaniards they would certainly have roasted and eaten them parties were sent out to explore the woods in search of habitations but none could be found the inhabitants in all directions had fled carrying with them their provisions the day was spent here it was a day of dreadful suffering life was preserved by devouring berries roots and leaves several plantations were discovered but there was generally not an individual an animal or a kernel of corn left behind in one place they found concealed two sacks of wheat two jars of wine and a few plantains these morgan divided among those who were nearest to perishing of hunger the sixth day they continued their march still along the banks of the chagres river such as could not walk were paddled along in light canoes at night they came to a plantation which as usual was entirely abandoned their supper consisted mainly of leaves and grass the next day at noon they discovered a barn full of indian corn in the husk they fell upon it and devoured it dry with the rapacity of a herd of swine having satiated their hunger each man loaded himself with as much as he could carry with renovated spirits they pressed on their way 
after journeying along for a couple of hours they came upon a band of about two hundred indians who fled with the utmost precipitation they were far more fleet of foot than the exhausted pirates and not one of them was shot or captured in their flight the indians threw back a shower of arrows which wounded several of the pirates and killed three of them they shouted out in spanish ah ye dogs go to the plain go to the plain they now reached such a bend in the river that it was necessary to cross it they therefore bivouacked for the night this place was called santa cruz loud murmurings filled the camp morgan was denounced in unmeasured terms they were indeed involved in gloom to go back was certain starvation and destruction seemed equally to threaten them in a farther advance there were some however who still kept up their courage and shouted onward onward the morning of the seventh day they crossed the river as it was supposed that they must soon meet the spaniards every man was required carefully to examine his musket and pistols to be ready for any engagement the guides told them that they were approaching the important town of cruz where they would find provisions and other stores in abundance this was called the halfway house between chagres and panama though it was sixty miles from the former place and but twenty-four from the latter to this point the chagres merchandise was taken in boats when the river was full and being landed was conveyed to panama on the backs of mules to give the reader some idea of the style of esquemeling's narrative written two hundred years ago i will quote his graphic description of what ensued his account was written in dutch but translated into english and published in london while yet a considerable distance from cruz they perceived much smoke to arise out of the chimneys the sight thereof afforded them great joy and hopes of finding people in the town and afterwards what they most desired was plenty of good cheer thus they went on with as much haste as they could making several arguments to one another upon those external signs though all alike castles built in the air for said they there is smoke cometh out of every house therefore they are making good fires for to roast and boil what we are to eat with other things to this purpose at length they arrived in great haste all sweating and panting but found no person in the town nor anything that was eatable wherewith to refresh themselves unless it were good fires to warm themselves which they wanted not for the spaniards before their departure had every one set fire to his own house excepting only the storehouses and stables belonging to the king they had not left behind them any beast whatever either alive or dead this occasioned much confusion in their minds they not finding the least thing to take hold of unless it were some few cats and dogs which they immediately killed and devoured with great appetite at last in the king's stables they found by good fortune fifteen or sixteen jars of peru wine and a leather sack full of bread but no sooner had they begun to drink of the said wine when they fell sick almost every man this sudden disaster made them think that the wine was poisoned which caused a new consternation in the whole camp as judging themselves now to be irrevocably lost but the true reason was their huge want of sustenance in that whole voyage and the manifold sorts of trash which they had eaten upon that occasion their sickness was so great that day as caused them to remain there till next morning without being able to prosecute their journey as they used to do in the afternoon here captain morgan was constrained to leave his canoes and land all his men though never so weak in their bodies but lest the canoes should be surprised or take too many men for their defence he resolved to send them all back to the place where the boats were excepting one which he caused to be hidden to the intent it might serve to carry intelligence according to the exigency of affairs many of the spaniards and indians belonging to this village were fled unto the plantations thereabouts hereupon captain morgan gave express orders that none should dare to go out of the village except in whole companies of one hundred together the occasion hereof was his fear lest the enemies should take an advantage upon his men by any sudden assault 
notwithstanding one party of english soldiers stickled not to contravene these commands being thereunto tempted with the desire of finding victuals but these were soon glad to fly into the town again being assaulted with great fury by some spaniards and indians who snatched up one of the pirates and carried him away prisoner thus the vigilancy and care of captain morgan was not sufficient to prevent every accident which might happen on the morning of the eighth morgan reviewed his troops he found that he had still eleven hundred resolute men at his command he selected a band of two hundred of his best marksmen as an advance guard they were to watch vigilantly for ambuscades the path they were to traverse was very narrow at many places but two could pass abreast cautiously they proceeded for ten hours encountering no sign of an enemy at length they reached a dark wooded gorge which the sunlight could scarcely penetrate apparently no one could enter the dense thickets around of bushes thorns and intertwining vines but by hewing his way with the hatchet a high mountain rose before them but nature had tunneled it so that there was a narrow path through this remarkable place was called quebrada obscura suddenly from the impenetrable forest which enveloped the mountain a shower of arrows fell upon them like hailstones from the clouds they probably exaggerated the number in estimating them at between three and four thousand they came rushing as by some supernatural impulse through the leaves no hand was seen no sound was heard no movement was perceptible there was but that one flight of arrows and no more those who with sinewy arms had thrown them in some mysterious way escaped as it were vanished this singular and inexplicable assault threw the army into great confusion for a moment these reckless men were staggered it seems strange but one-eighth of the pirates were killed and ten wounded by this shower of arrows after a few moments delay the pirates moved cautiously forward threading the narrow tunnel through which but two could walk abreast until they came out upon a very rough plain on the other side encumbered with huge rocks and a growth of gigantic trees to this vantage ground the indians had retreated and here they seemed disposed to make a stand quite a fierce battle ensued the indians could be seen in large numbers dodging from rock to rock and from tree to tree they fought with great bravery their chief was a very handsome young fellow gorgeously dressed and with a very brilliant coronet of variegated feathers he seemed to have no fear at length in his zeal he plunged headlong upon the pirates utterly regardless of numbers and endeavored to thrust his javelin through one a little in the advance the blow was parried and he was instantly shot down as he was seen to fall there was a loud cry from his followers and without discharging another shaft they all fled the pirates impetuously pursued the fugitives could not be overtaken a few of the boldest concealed themselves behind trees and thickets whence they could make good their retreat and worried the pirates with a random fire which sorely wounded a few without accomplishing any important results the buccaneers entered soon upon a broad treeless prairie here they halted to tend the wounded at some distance before them there was another rocky and wooded eminence the indians who seemed to be swarming there were evidently preparing for another battle a party of fifty men was sent by a circuitous route to attack them in the rear their watchful eyes detected the movement with nimble feet they fled shouting to their assailants to the plain to the plain you english dogs the pirates rightly interpreted these words to mean that on the plain before panama a large body of spaniards was assembled and that there the great struggle was to take place many spaniards were with the indians at this point which was but a few miles from panama they disappeared the next night there came one of those flooding rains with which tropical lands were so often deluged the pirates in vain sought shelter from the drenching storm there was the blackness of darkness with thunderings and lightnings and the howlings of the tornado there were many plantations on the route where houses and huts had been reared but the indians had applied the torch 
every building was in ashes the cattle were driven away all provisions were removed or consumed these wretched men on their fiend-like mission were still starving the next morning which was the ninth of their journey the rain ceased heavy clouds floated through the sky darkening the sun and thus enabling them to march sheltered from its scorching rays a well-mounted troop of twenty spaniards appeared at some distance in the advance watching all the movements of the invaders during the day they came to quite a high mountain which it was necessary to cross from its summit they first caught sight of the pacific ocean and of the bay of panama upon whose shores the city of the same name was situated in the bay there was a large spanish ship riding at anchor six boats were under sail directing their course toward the islands of taboja and tabojilla which were about eighteen miles distant at this sight the pirates raised shouts of joy never doubting their own prowess they considered their toils as ended and the city with all its treasures as already in their possession at the foot of the mountain there was a large grassy plain over which thousands of cattle were grazing cows horses bulls mules and donkeys with a rush the piratic gangs descended the mountain and with the voracity of famished wolves fell upon the cattle one shot a horse another felled a cow but the greater part slaughtered the mules which were most numerous some kindled fires others collected wood and the strongest hunted the cattle while the invalids slew and skinned and flayed the whole plain was soon alight with a hundred fires the hungry men cut off lumps of flesh carbonated them in the flame and ate them half raw with incredible haste and ferocity they resembled esquemeling says rather cannibals than christians the blood running down their beards to the middle of their bodies monarch of the main volume two page one one four end of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of Captain William Kidd and Others of the Buccaneers by John S. C. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One: The Capture of Panama. First Sight of the City. The Spanish Scouts Appear. Morgan's Advance. Character of the Country. Fears of the Spaniards. Removal of Treasure. Capture of the City. The Poisoned Wine. Magnificent Scenery of the Bay description of panama and its surroundings wealth of the city scenes of crime and cruelty morgan was an extraordinary man fear never appalled him he was never discouraged by disasters passion was never allowed to throw him off his guard he shared in full all the hardships of his demoniac crew though hungry and weary himself and sympathizing with his starving men in their sufferings he did not in the least degree remit his watchfulness or lose his self-control perceiving the danger that his men in their famished condition indulging in such reckless gluttony might induce sickness which would incapacitate them for battle he ordered a false alarm to be sounded instantly every man seized his musket and ran to his appointed place in the ranks morgan had taken the precaution before descending the mountain to order every musket to be discharged and loaded afresh from fear that the powder might have become damp there were several miles yet to be traversed over plains and through forests before the pirates could enter the streets of the city which they had discerned in the distance cautiously they continued their march until the approach of evening when they ascended an eminence which commanded a perfect view of the city with its steeples houses and streets all aglow with the rays of the setting sun here the shouts of exultation were renewed the pirates strengthened by their feast danced for joy beating their drums sounding their trumpets firing off their muskets and exulting as in the hour of perfect victory here they encamped for the night waiting impatiently for the morning which would usher in the decisive battle in the evening two hundred mounted spaniards rode out from the city dashed along until they came within hailing distance of the pirates and shouted out to them words which could not be understood morgan established double sentinels and all his men slept upon their arms 
at daybreak on the tenth day the spaniards from their walls sounded with bugle peal and drum beat a challenge to their foes the pirates were equally eager for the fight rapidly they advanced into the plain the spaniards on horseback and on foot crowded out to meet them in glittering battalions they were drawn up upon the plain outnumbering the pirates three to one there were two squadrons of cavalry four regiments of foot and most singular to relate a huge number of wild bulls roaring and tossing their horns driven by a great number of indians and a few mounted matadors it is recorded that the pirates were surprised and alarmed in view of the force thus to be encountered many of them wished they were at home no quarter was to be expected there was no hope for them but in fighting with the utmost desperation all were conscious of this they therefore bound themselves by the most solemn oaths to conquer or to spend the last drop of their blood morgan formed his men into three battalions after selecting a band of two hundred sharpshooters to skirmish in the advance many of the spaniards were armed in glittering coats of mail their silken banners richly embroidered presented a beautiful appearance as they fluttered in the rays of the morning sun the spaniards sent forward a squadron of horse as they came galloping over the plain morgan's skirmishers fell upon one knee in the tall grass and opened upon them a very destructive fire several riders dropped from their horses several horses struck by the bullets and appalled by the sudden explosion of two hundred guns became uncontrollable and rushed wildly over the plain in all directions the bulls writes thornberry proved as fatal to those who employed them as the elephants to porous driven on the rear of the buccaneers they took fright at the noise of the battle a few only broke through the english companies and trampled the red colors under foot but these were soon shot by the old hunters a few fled to the savannah and the rest tore back and carried havoc through the spanish ranks the plain was rough with ravines and quagmires so that the cavalry could not operate to advantage the desperate pirates were all reckless of their courage and nearly all unerring in their aim the spaniards were also men of war and blood who had been guilty of the greatest atrocities as they had cut down and robbed the native tribes they fought with ferocity equal to that of the pirates in this battle it was in reality fiend against fiend the spaniards were as bad as the pirates for two hours the battle raged with intensest fury there was neither tree stump nor rock to protect either party from the bullets which with deadly velocity swept the plain on the one side there were eleven hundred pirates esquemeling estimates the force of the spaniards at four hundred cavalry and two thousand four hundred infantry there were also one or two hundred indians and negroes to drive the wild bulls through the english camp hoping thus to break their lines and throw them into confusion the spaniards had also dug trenches and raised batteries to arrest the advance of their foes morgan as usual ordered his men to approach the city by a circuitous route so as to avoid the batteries in preparation for this movement he ordered a review of the troops he concealed from his troops the number of pirates who had fallen but announced probably with some exaggeration that six hundred of the spaniards lay dead upon the field it would seem that the spaniards had not been very sanguine as to the result of the battle for they had shipped to the island of taboja much of their portable wealth and all of their women in the battle thus far the spaniards had been so decidedly beaten that they had abandoned the field and horse and foot had taken a new stand behind the ramparts many prisoners had been taken including quite a number of catholic priests morgan not wishing to be encumbered with prisoners ordered them all to be pistoled the pirates had lost heavily but their loss exasperated instead of disheartening them esquemeling writes the pirates were nothing discouraged seeing their numbers so much diminished but rather filled with greater pride than before perceiving what huge advantage they had obtained against their enemies thus having rested themselves some while they prepared to march courageously toward the city plighting their oaths to one another that they would fight till never a man were left alive with this courage they recommenced their march either to conquer or to be conquered 
they found much difficulty in their approach unto the city for within the town the spaniards had placed many great guns at several quarters thereof some of which were charged with small pieces of iron and others with musket bullets with all these they saluted the pirates at their drawing nigh unto the place and gave them full and frequent broadsides firing at them incessantly from whence it happened that they lost at every step they advanced great numbers of men but neither these manifest dangers of their lives nor the sight of so many of their own dropping down continually at their sides could deter them from advancing farther and gaining ground every moment upon the enemy thus although the spaniards never ceased to fire and act the best they could for their defence yet notwithstanding they were forced to deliver the city after the space of three hours combat and the pirates having now possessed themselves thereof both killed and destroyed as many as attempted to make the least opposition against them the inhabitants had caused the best of their goods to be transported unto more remote and occult places howbeit they found within the city as yet several warehouses well stocked with all sorts of merchandise as well silks and cloths as linen and other things of considerable value as soon as the first fury of their entrance into the city was over captain morgan assembled all his men at a certain place which he assigned and there commanded them under very great penalties that none of them should dare to drink or taste any wine the reason he gave for this injunction was because he had received private intelligence that it had been all poisoned by the spaniards howbeit it was the opinion of many that he gave those prudent orders to prevent the debauchery of his people which he foresaw would be very great at the beginning after so much hunger sustained by the way fearing withal lest the spaniards seeing them in wine should rally their forces and use them as inhumanly as they had used the inhabitants before morgan was now master of panama the city with nearly all of its wealth had fallen into his hands and still the vanquished spaniards could rally a force greatly outnumbering his own the bay of panama is one of peculiar beauty at that time its shores were fringed with luxuriant groves of oranges figs and limes the feathery tops of the coconut trees towered over all the rest rivalled only by the lofty tamarinds through the rich foliage there peeped in much picturesque beauty numerous cane-built huts indian children entirely unclothed were running about upon the beach while birch canoes light as bubbles were skimming the placid waves the islands of tavoja and tavojilla appeared in the distance as masses of foliage the mines of mexico and peru had emptied their floods of wealth into that port many of the mansions were architecturally magnificent they were adorned with the richest paintings and with the most costly furniture the spanish grandees had hung upon their walls the masterpieces of titian murillo and velasquez the streets of the city were broad an unusual circumstance in spanish cities and were lined with the most beautiful and ever flowering of tropical trees within the walls of the city there was a cathedral of imposing magnitude and towering splendor there were also eight monasteries massive buildings occupied by the religious orders and abundantly supplied with works of art the broad avenues were lined with two thousand mansions of the wealthy and five thousand smaller houses and shops crowded the more busy streets the most imposing block in the city was what was called the genoese warehouses these belonged to a company who had enriched themselves by the slave trade an immense number of horses and mules were used in transporting goods across the isthmus from one ocean to the other these were kept in long rows of stables admirably arranged the products of the mines of gold and silver were melted down into solid bars called plate or bullion and in that form were sent to the old world the city was surrounded with rich plantations and highly artistic gardens panama was the city to which all the treasures of peru were annually brought 
the plate fleet laden with bars of gold and silver arrived here at certain periods brimming with the crown wealth as well as that of private merchants it returned laden with the merchandise of panama and the spanish main to be sold in peru and chile and still oftener with droves of negro slaves that the genoese imported from the coast of guinea to toil and die in the peruvian mines so wealthy was this golden city that more than two thousand mules were employed in the transport of the gold and silver from thence to porto bello where the galleons were loaded the merchants of panama were proverbially the richest in the whole spanish west indies the governor of panama was the suzerain of porto bello nata cruz and Baruja. the bishop of panama was primate of the terra firma and the suffragan to the archbishop of peru the district of panama was the most healthy of all the spanish colonies rich in mines and so well wooded that its ship timber covered with vessels both the northern and the southern seas its land yielded full crops and its broad savannas pastured innumerable herds of wild cattle monarch of the main volume two page one fifty nine such was the city and province which had fallen into the hands of this gang of pirates they found the booty notwithstanding all the spaniards had removed rich beyond their most sanguine expectations the stores were still crowded with goods of great value wine spices olive oil silks and cloths of every variety of fabric were found in great abundance the magazines were amply supplied with corn and other provisions morgan himself was surprised at the grandeur of his capture he was also alarmed in view of his own peril the force which could still be arrayed against him was far greater than he had anticipated he was in imminent danger of being cut off from his return to the ships there were several spanish vessels aground in the port morgan seized them with the high tide they were floated he manned them with the most desperate of his gang and sent them to the islands and to pursue the vessels which had escaped with treasure along the coast there was one royal spanish mercantile vessel in particular of four hundred tons which had escaped laden with church plate and jewels and the richest merchandise it had put to sea in the greatest haste with but seven guns and but about a dozen muskets it was poorly supplied with food and water and had only the uppermost sails of the mainmast to spread all the females of the nunnery were on board this ship and the most valuable ornaments of the church morgan was anxious to make an immediate pursuit of this vessel had he done so the vessel would easily have been captured but for a time he lost the control of his demoniac crew inflamed with wine for morgan's prohibition had no effect and rushing into the most pitiless debauchery they spent many hours in scenes which neither sodom nor gomorrah could ever have outrivalled thus the ship escaped it is said that it contained gold and silver of greater value than all the treasures found in panama morgan probably foresaw that unless he could destroy these liquors with which the city was filled his men would become entirely disorganized and the spaniards falling upon the drunken rabble would easily cut them to pieces he could not destroy liquors before the eyes of the pirates for they would not permit it he set fire to the city in various quarters carefully spreading the report that the conflagration was kindled by the spaniards themselves the fire spread with such rapidity that in a few hours nearly all of the business portion was laid in ashes most of the humbler buildings were of wood with thatched roofs they burned like tinder two hundred stores with all their contents were destroyed the genoese warehouses were burned there were many poor slaves imprisoned in them they were consumed by the all-devouring flames this energetic commander as pitiless as any beast which ever howled in the jungle had accomplished his purpose his troops were driven out of the flaming streets into the fields and there they were compelled to encamp these wretched men satiated with gluttony drunkenness and debauchery began now to awake with new eagerness to their old passion for plunder 
four vessels were dispatched to visit the islands and to cruise along the coast in both directions one hundred and sixty men were sent back to chagres to convey supplies to the troops in garrison there and to inform them of the great victory daily companies of two hundred men one party relieving another were sent out to explore the region around they returned every night with a group of pale and trembling prisoners and with mules laden with treasure these unhappy captives were tortured to compel them to reveal where treasure of which they knew nothing was concealed the father the mother the maiden daughter and the child were alike stretched on the bed of torture neither innocence beauty nor virtue afforded the female captive any protection a pauper spaniard not much more than half-witted wandered during the confusion into a rich man's house stripped off his rags and clothed himself in costly linen with breeches of bright red taffeta and a coat of silk velvet as he was foolishly strutting about admiring his finery the pirates broke in and seized him as their prize they believed or assumed to believe that he was the master of the house and demanded that he should inform them where he had concealed his treasure in vain he pointed to his rags and protested by all the saints that he had lived upon charity there was nothing he could reveal these cruel men stretched him on the rack they dislocated his joints they twisted a cord around his forehead till his eyes appeared as big as eggs and were ready to fall out they hung him up by the thumbs and scourged him they cut off his nose and ears and singed his face with blazing straw then with the thrusts of their lances they put him to death after this execrable manner rice esquemilling did many others of these miserable prisoners finish their days the common sport and recreation of these pirates being these and other tragedies not inferior to these End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of captain william kidd and others of the buccaneers by john s c abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two the return from panama return of the explorers the beautiful captive sympathy in her behalf embarrassments of morgan inflexible virtue of the captive the conspiracy efficiency of morgan his obduracy the search of the pirates the return march morgan cheats the pirates runs away the vessels which morgan sent out to the islands and to cruise along the shore all returned within about eight days they came laden with merchandise and with captives the fate of the female captives was dreadful in this treatment none of the men were worse than morgan himself in one of the shiploads of captives there was a spanish lady of exquisite beauty she was quite young and the wife of a wealthy merchant then absent in peru she is described by both esquemeling and oxmelin as a lady endowed with such loveliness as is rarely seen upon earth esquemeling writes her years were few and her beauty so great as peradventure i may doubt whether in all christendom any could be found to surpass her perfections either of comeliness or honesty oxmelin gives a more detailed account of her charms he says that her hair was in glossy silken ringlets of jet black though a brunette her complexion was of dazzling purity her large lustrous black eyes beamed with a peculiar expression of tenderness which won the admiration of all who beheld her the roughest pirates were subdued and softened by her presence to them she presented almost the image of the virgin mary and they regarded her charms as angelic the moment morgan cast his eyes upon her he was overawed and captivated by her beauty and was inspired with the most intense desire to win her love others had been his slaves subject to his brutal will but this lady with her beauty her grace her accomplishments her virtue so far vanquished him that he could not approach her but as a suppliant for her favour 
love the essence of the deity is under some circumstances in its legitimate bearing the most purifying of influences under other circumstances it is the most debasing and brutalizing of passions it was observed that the demeanor of morgan became quite changed he became more social more gentle and was particularly attentive to his dress clothing himself in his richest attire he ordered his beautiful captive to be separated from the other prisoners appointed a negress to wait upon her sent her delicate viands from his own table and treated her in all respects with the greatest consideration the negress was instructed to do everything in her power to convince the captive lady that her captor was not a beast and a heretic as she had been taught to believe but a gentleman and a christian a man of polished manners and cultivated mind esquemeling writes this lady had formerly heard strange reports concerning the pirates before their arrival at panama as if they were not men but heretics who did neither invoke the blessed trinity nor believe in jesus christ but now she began to have better thoughts of them than ever before having experienced the manifold civilities of captain morgan especially as she heard him many times swear by the name of god and of jesus christ in whom she had been persuaded that they did not believe neither did she now think them to be so bad or to have the shapes of beasts as she had often heard for as to the names of robbers or thieves which was commonly given them she wondered not much at it seeing as she had that among all nations there were to be found some wicked men who naturally coveted to possess the goods of others morgan visited the lady with smiles and bows and costly presents he flooded her chambers with robes jewels and perfumes she was not deceived and when he ventured to propose that she should abandon her husband and become virtually his wife and accompany him to the home of splendor with which he would provide her she repelled him with indignation and loathing replying to him with all the eloquence of impassioned innocence she said sir my life is in your hands but sooner shall my soul be separated from my body than i will surrender myself to your demands this repulse stirred up the rage of the infamous pirate he stripped her of her rich attire left her only the coarsest garments and threw her into a dark and loathsome dungeon she was supplied with only enough food to support life by these brutalities he hoped to break her spirit and to compel her to acquiesce in his wishes even demons can appreciate true nobility of character the beauty and virtues of this lady had won in some degree the sympathy of the vilest of these wretches morgan could not conceal his treatment from them they began to murmur to denounce him to curse him as a brute i myself says esquemeling was an eye-witness of the lady's sufferings and could never have believed that such constancy and virtue could have been found in the world had i not been assured thereof by my own eyes and ears morgan became alarmed by the threatening aspect assumed by his men various causes had been for some time undermining his authority he knew full well that there was not one of these desperadoes who would hesitate for one moment to thrust a poniard into his heart or to pierce his brain with a bullet these pirates were all consummate villains there was no sense of honor among them there was no crime from which they would shrink did they deem it for their interest to commit it even their sympathy for the beautiful captive lady resolved itself mainly into jealousy of the captain had they seized her unprotected in the halls of a nunnery she would have experienced no mercy whatever at their hands the pirates flushed with their great victory and the vast amount of wealth of every kind at their disposal had formed a conspiracy in which more than a hundred were implicated their plan was to get rid of morgan then to seize one of the islands in the neighborhood as their rendezvous and to make it their stronghold with the vessels they already had and the ships they would soon capture they would have an invincible fleet then they would sweep the pacific ocean and ravage all the coasts of chile and peru 
after they had acquired sufficient plunder to make them all millionaires they would return to europe by the way of the east indies picking up ships by the way and would then disperse to seek new homes and riot in luxury for the remainder of their days in preparation for this movement they had secreted several of the large guns of the town and an ample store of ammunition but morgan was equal to this emergency one of the conspirators betrayed the rest the first intimation the conspirators had that their design was discovered was in seeing every vessel and boat in the harbor in flames every piece of artillery in the place was spiked thus they were entirely frustrated in their plan orders were then given to pack the mules with treasure and to make immediate preparation to return to chagres the plunder of panama had not yet been divided though every pirate had taken the most solemn oath that all the booty should be thrown into common stock and that he would not secret anything no one had any confidence in the oath of another morgan ordered every man to be searched from the crown of his head to the soles of his shoes though morgan himself submitted to be first searched they were all exasperated by this every man was compelled to discharge his musket to prove that no jewels were hidden in its barrel the french portion of the pirates were especially enraged against morgan many oaths were uttered that they would put him to death before they reached jamaica in a few days all the treasure was packed in convenient bales and placed upon the backs of the mules the church plate was beaten into shapeless lumps for more convenient stowage the treasure which could not be removed they wantonly destroyed one hundred and fifty men were sent to chagres to bring the boats as far up the river as the stream was navigable he informed the prisoners that he should take all as slaves to jamaica who did not through their friends obtain an ample ransom for the ransom of his beautiful captive from whom he now rather desired to be relieved he demanded thirty thousand dollars two of the ecclesiastics were permitted to go to her friends to obtain this money it was immediately furnished them they returned with it and treacherously instead of ransoming her employed the money for the ransom of their own particular friends this treachery was known throughout the army even the pirates denounced it the murmurs in the camp were so loud that morgan was compelled to heed them and he gave the lady her liberty on the morning of the twenty fourth of february sixteen seventy one these robbers set out on their return to chagres many of the captive women implored captain morgan upon their knees with loud lamentations to permit them to remain with their husbands and their children unfeelingly he replied i did not come here to listen to the cries of women but to obtain money bring me money and you shall be released if you do not you shall surely go to jamaica when the march began writes esquemeling these lamentable cries and shrieks were renewed insomuch that it would have caused compassion in the hardest heart to hear them but captain morgan as a man little given to mercy was not moved therewith in the least the line of march was as before first there were scouts a quarter of a mile in advance of the troops then followed the advance guard in great strength the prisoners came next with the heavily laden mules the remainder of the pirates formed the rear guard they goaded forward the fainting tottering despairing captives with push of javelin and prick of sabre when they reached the blackened ruins of the town of cruz which was at the head of boat navigation the mules were unloaded and their burdens were placed in the canoes there was a necessary delay here of several days and quite a number of the prisoners who had written agonizing letters to their friends received their money and paid their ransom morgan still had with him many woe-stricken spaniards and one hundred and fifty negro slaves these last he deemed cash articles for they would bring the money in any ports of the west indies from cruz the pirates advanced in two parties one in the boats and another on the land chagres was reached without any event occurring of special importance immediately after his arrival morgan with his characteristic energy sent some of his prisoners to the important town of puerto velo frequently called puerto bello with the announcement that if the citizens did not forthwith send him a large ransom he would utterly demolish the castle and lay all the works there in ruins 
as chagres was the all-important port of entry for the whole province he thought that this threat would bring the money they however paid no heed to it the booty was now divided the pirates were bitterly disappointed in finding that the whole estimated value amounted to but about two million dollars probably ten times that sum which they could not remove had been destroyed in their rapacity every man had expected at least ten thousand dollars when they found that but one thousand was their share they were greatly enraged this pittance was scarcely sufficient for the carouse of a single week loud and threatening murmurs rose from nearly all lips they accused morgan of cheating them the consummate knave with great adroitness had done so many of his men had conspired against him with far greater ability he was now conspiring against them he had taken a few into his confidence to share the spoil which they were to steal from the rest the common sailors had no idea of the value of diamonds and other precious stones his partisans bought them up at not one hundredth part of their real value massive bars of gold were easily concealed morgan endeavored to engross the attention of his men in plundering burning and destroying chagres while apparently his whole force in the delirium of intoxication were engaged in this work morgan and his accomplices repaired on board the ships quietly in the night weighed anchor and taking advantage of a fair wind before the morning were out of sight with all their treasure their dupes consisting of nearly one half of the piratic crew were left on the shore amid the ruins without food without a boat without shelter in utter destitution what ultimately became of them is not known probably some starved some were shot by the spaniard some were caught and hung vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord we have no more details respecting the final career of this very able sagacious and infamous man we simply know that he reached jamaica in possession of an immense fortune there he was honored as one of the great men of his age charles the second king of england whose accomplice he is said to have been in his piracies rewarded him for his achievements appointed him governor of the island and conferred upon him the honors of a baronetcy we know not when he died but we do know that however sir henry morgan may have escaped the penalty of his sins in this world he has long ago appeared before the tribunal of that god who will render to every man according to his deeds End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of Captain William Kidd and Others of the Buccaneers » by John S. C. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23. Montbar the Fanatic Partial Solution of a Mystery Montbar's Birth His Education and Delusions Anecdote of the Dramatic Performance montbar runs away from home enters the navy his ferocious exploits joins the buccaneers desperate battles on the land and on the sea his final disappearance in reading the narrative of the cruelties practised by the pirates upon the spaniards the mind is often oppressed with the thought that a god of infinite love and power should have allowed such scenes to have been enacted there is nothing conceivable in intense and protracted torture which was not inflicted upon men women and children there is no satisfactory explanation of this great mystery of earth still there are considerations which may perhaps point in the direction of a solution the pirates seem to have been permitted to revenge upon the spaniards the awful sufferings which they had inflicted upon the indians the spanish armies of cortez and pizarro ravaged the homes of the innocent native inhabitants of those countries with ferocity and cruelty which satan and his legions could not possibly have surpassed the spaniards had thrown the indian into the flames of the most awful misery and then god allowed the pirate to throw the spaniard into the same 
same flames there was a celebrated pirate by the name of montbar who seemed to have been inspired with fanatical frenzy approaching maniacal fury against the whole spanish nation he was the child of one of the most opulent and respected families in languedoc in france he had received all the advantages of education which wealth could afford in the process of his education he had read the account of the atrocities practised by the spaniards on their conquest of the islands and the continents of the new world the blood of this ardent young man seemed to boil in his veins while pondering these fiend-like crimes as a child he brooded over these tortures until he became almost insane soon he devoted himself to all martial exercises that he might avenge the wrongs of the indians this generous but cruel determination grew rapidly into monomania the animal forces of a mind of unusual energy were all concentrated in this direction revenge for the wrongs practised upon the cubans the peruvians the mexicans occupied his thoughts by day and his dreams by night this became the all-absorbing passion of his soul even when a child practising with his crossbow he said i wish to shoot well only that i may know how to kill the spaniards george w thornberry in his sketch of this singular man alluding to the spanish enormities in the new world writes fanaticism avarice and ambition had ruled like a trinity of devils over the beautiful regions desolated and plague-smitten by the spaniards whole nations had become extinct the name of christ was polluted into the mere cipher of an armed and aggressive commerce these books had impressed the gloomy boy with a deep absorbing fanatical hatred of the conquerors and a fierce pity for the conquered he believed himself marked out by god as the gideon sent to their relief dreams of riches and gratified ambition spurred him unconsciously to the task he thought and dreamed of nothing but the murdered indians he inquired eagerly from travellers for news from america and testified prodigious and ungovernable joy when he heard that the spaniards had been defeated by the caribs and the bravos he indeed knew by heart every deed of atrocity that history recorded of his enemies and would dilate upon each one with a rude and impatient eloquence the following story he was frequently accustomed to relate and to gloat over with a look that indicated a mind capable of even greater cruelty if once led away by a fanatic spirit of retaliation a spaniard the story ran was once upon a time appointed governor of an indian province which was inhabited by a fierce and warlike race of savages he proved a cruel governor unforgiving in his resentments and insatiable in his avarice the indians unable any longer to endure either his barbarities or his exactions seized him and showing him gold told him that they had at last been able by great good luck to find enough to satisfy his demands they then held him firm and melting the ore poured it down his throat till he expired in torments under their hands the peculiarities of this young man were singularly exhibited on one occasion which showed that his mental operations were so deranged that he could not calmly reflect upon anything connected with the spanish nation at one of the college exhibitions a comedy was to be enacted by the students in which montbar was to take a part during the performance there was a dialogue to take place between a spaniard and a frenchman montbar represented the frenchman and one of his companions the spaniard the spaniard appeared first upon the stage and began to utter a tirade of extravagancies against france denouncing and ridiculing the french in unmeasured terms montbar listened with ever-increasing excitement until he lost all self-control the mimic scene in his mind became a reality in a perfect fury he broke upon the stage assailed the representative spaniard like a maniac called him a liar and a murderer knocked him down and would inevitably have killed him had he not been dragged away by the terrified bystanders 
the boy developed a very active and powerful mind and his wealthy father was very proud of him his eccentricities did not alarm him as he thought that contact with the world would soon remove them all he wished his son to study some profession but montbar insisted upon entering the army i wish to learn to fight said he that i may kill the spaniards as his friends opposed his entering the army he ran away from home and found his way to havre here he had an uncle who was in command of one of the king's ships france was then at war with spain the ship was just entering upon a cruise against the spaniards the uncle pleased with the enthusiasm of the boy and with the intensity of his desire to join the expedition wrote to the father and obtained his reluctant consent in a few days the ship sailed the young fanatic kept a constant watch for the foe evincing the most intense eagerness for an engagement the moment any sail appeared he armed himself and seemed overjoyed with the thought that he might soon wreak vengeance on the spaniards at length a spanish ship appeared soon they met and exchanged broadsides montbar was quite intoxicated with joy he was perfectly reckless not a thought of danger entered his mind when the order was given to board montbar sabre in hand led the party and was the first to leap on board the spanish ship he seemed to bear a charmed life and to be endowed with herculean strength he sought no assistance from his comrades but plunged into the thickest of the enemy hewing on his right hand and his left with marvellous strength twice he rushed from end to end of the vessel mowing down all who opposed him he would give no quarter the spaniards were overpowered their slaughter was awful montbar dreaming that he was god's appointed minister of vengeance was in an ecstasy of exultation as he cut down some ran his sabre through the heart of others and drove others into the sea his spirit inspired the rest nearly every spaniard was killed his uncle succeeded in saving one or two the prize was found to be of immense value the hold was crammed with riches there was one casket of diamonds of almost priceless worth while the captain and the crew were examining these treasures and rejoicing over them montbar regarded them with entire indifference he was counting the dead blood not plunder was what his soul craved as there was now war between france and spain the french buccaneers even when acting without any formal commission were regarded by the government as engaged in legitimate warfare the buccaneers of england robbing spanish commerce and spanish colonies were encouraged and aided by the french navy the conflict we have described took place near the shores of santo domingo montbar's uncle learned from his prisoners that the ship he had captured had been separated by a storm from two others and that they were bound to port margot on the island he immediately sailed to the vicinity of that port where he kept watch the vessel he had captured was used as a decoy he placed french soldiers on board unfurled the flag of spain and stood off and on waiting the arrival of the two vessels while thus on the watch some buccaneers from the shore came on board in canoes with provisions to sell they had been wrecked upon the coast and while a part of their number had been at a distance from the camp hunting the spaniards had fallen upon them put them to flight and plundered their stores why do you suffer thus exclaimed montbar indignantly we do not mean to suffer it they replied we know what the spaniards are and what our power is we are collecting our forces and will soon take signal vengeance upon them let me go with you said montbar i do not ask to be your leader but i will go at your head i will be the first to expose myself and will show you how i can fight these accursed spaniards gladly they accepted his offer his ardor and energy inspired them with great confidence in him his uncle very reluctantly allowed him to go cursing him as a foolish hare-brained madcap ever eager to push his head into danger yet the uncle was very proud of him as young montbar descended the side of the ship into a canoe the captain said exultingly to one at his side there goes as brave a lad as ever trod a plank the buccaneers returned to their camp and immediately in a strong war party set out in search of the spaniards 
they threaded intricate paths through the woods until they opened upon a small treeless prairie which they called a savanna just before entering this field which was surrounded by hills and woods they saw in the distance a mounted party of spaniards who were evidently on the march to attack them montbar was transported with rage at the sight of the spaniards he was ready single-handed to rush upon them at once he alone against several hundred regardless whether the others followed him or not but an old experienced buccaneer who led the party held him back stop said he there is plenty of time if you do as i tell you not one of those fellows shall escape these words not one of those fellows shall escape arrested the impetuous young man the buccaneers halted pretending not to have seen the spaniards they allowed one or two of their number to exhibit themselves as if belonging to a hunting party they then pitched their tent of linen apparently entirely unconscious that they were near any foe drawing out their brandy flasks they feigned a great revel singing songs shouting and passing the flasks from one to another as if in the wildest of drunken bouts this was done by a small portion of the company while most of the buccaneers were hidden in ambush the spaniards having secreted themselves watched all these movements they supposed that the buccaneers stupefied with drink would ere long fall helplessly asleep the spaniards would then creep cautiously upon them and kill them all but the cunning old buccaneer had taken good care that the brandy flasks should all be empty not a single drop of intoxicating drink had the feigned revellers taken as soon as darkness veiled the scene the buccaneers all assembled in ambuscade anticipating a midnight attack every musket was in order and their brains were cool and uninflamed with drink the spaniards delayed their attack until daylight as the hours lingered away montbar was restless and chafed like a caged lion saying that they would never come and imploring permission to march out and attack them at daybreak the buccaneers discerned a dark line moving noiselessly over the ridge and descending into the plain they knew full well what this meant every movement was watched by the ambushed buccaneers cautiously the spaniards advanced they crossed the prairie and entered the forest intending to encircle the tent which they supposed held the sleeping buccaneers suddenly the woods seemed to burst into volcanic flame the report of the musketry was followed with shout and yell and the storm of lead swept through the ranks of the spaniards striking down scores either in death or grievously wounded the buccaneers rushed instantaneously upon their bewildered staggered bleeding foe montbar seemed animated by demoniacal frenzy he rushed upon the spaniards in utter recklessness regardless of their numbers or of the support he should receive from his comrades his heavy sabre flashed in all directions as if wielded by tireless sinews of steel soon he was quite in advance of his companions and was alone in the very thicket of the spanish squadron he would inevitably have been cut down had not the other buccaneers astonished at his audacity rushed to his rescue montbar's sword was dripping with blood he was in a frenzy of joy every blow he struck cut down a spaniard he exulted in the carnage and ever after declared that this was the happiest day of his life one grounded spaniard clung to his knee begging for mercy montbar brought down his sabre upon his head splitting it from crown to chin fiercely exclaiming i wish that you were the last of this accursed race an eye-witness of the battle describes the carnage as horrible nearly every spaniard was destroyed the victors all absorbed in their bloody work stumbled over the dying and the dead deaf to every cry for mercy the buccaneers were astonished and delighted by the prowess which montbar had displayed they entreated him to remain and become their captain but a signal gun fired by his uncle called him back to the ship montbar was placed as captain on board the large ship which his uncle had captured many of the pirates eagerly engaged to serve under him 
after a sail of eight days these two vessels encountered four spanish warships each one larger than either of those commanded by montbar or his uncle one of the most desperate of naval battles ensued the elder montbar was attacked by two of the ships for three hours they struggled grappled together receiving and giving the most terrible broadsides at last the three sank together in one watery grave the uncle it is said rejoicing to drag the other two ships with him went down laughing montbar with his crashing shot succeeded at length in sinking one of the ships assailing him and then he boarded the other the terror-stricken crew threw themselves into the water the floating bodies presented targets for the buccaneers no quarter was shown montbar rushed up and down the decks killing all he could reach his courage and accomplishments were so marvellous that his companions regarded him with superstitious reverence as endowed with more than mortal powers he himself ever averred that he was god's appointed messenger to avenge the wrongs the spaniards had inflicted upon the indians it is not known that a single individual escaped from these four spanish ships montbar had now two vessels at his command he engaged many other buccaneers in his service and soon had an army of nearly eight hundred men ready to follow him to the death he swept the seas and often landing ravaged the coasts we have no detailed account of his subsequent career one of his biographers writes and this completes all that history has preserved of one of the strangest combinations of fanatic and soldier that has ever appeared since the days of loyola in another age and under other circumstances he might have been a second mohammed equally remorseless his ambition though narrower seems to have been no less fervid if he was cruel we must allow him to have been sincere even in his fanaticism daring untiring of unequalled courage and unmatched resolution the cruelty of the spaniards he put down by greater cruelty he passes from us into unknown seas and we hear of him no more he died probably unconscious of crime unpitying and unpitied oxmelin who saw montbar at honduras describes him as active vivacious and full of fire like all the gascons he was of tall stature erect and firm his hair grand noble martial his complexion was sunburnt and the colour of his eyes could not be discerned under the deep arched vaulting of his bushy eyebrows his very glance in battle was said to intimidate the spaniards and to drive them to dis spare end of chapter twenty three end of captain william kidd and others of the buccaneers by john s c abbott